All my life, I've lived in cities. Washington, D.C., Tehran, San Francisco, Oakland, Brooklyn, Buenos Aires, Prague, Berlin. But in 2011, something happened in a city that forever changed the way I see the world. Now, there are things about living in the city that I adore. I love that right now, within two blocks of my apartment, there are six bakeries. I love public transit systems. I love the cute candy-colored maps and the futuristic trains. And I love cafes full of people staying up late debating politics. But then there are the things about the city that have always bothered me. The other day, I headed out. I walked along, and there was litter on the sidewalk and on the street and at the base of the tree, right? That little bit of soil we've left unpaved so that the tree can take in its nutrients and water, and it looks like a garbage bin. But I was in a hurry, and I didn't want to pick up that filthy stuff. So I went on my way, got in line for the bus, and up ahead of me, there was a little old lady. She was struggling with these two bags to climb that big step onto the bus. I could have pushed past the people between us, but I didn't. It's just part of life in the city, right? I headed on my way. I went to the subway. I said I love public transit, and I do. But the way we act on the subway, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. It's sort of like the zombie apocalypse, right? The, the bodies are there, but the brains are not in those subway cars. The other day, I was on the subway, and this young man came shuffling down the length of it. He was asking for money. He asked everyone for five cents. That's all he asked for. Not a single person on the train gave him money. Most people, they didn't even say no. They didn't speak to him. They treated him like he was heir. And me? I didn't give him five cents either. Now, all of this behavior has already struck me as at least unnatural. We're social animals, humans, right? We're supposed to be at least noticing each other. We're supposed to be assessing each other for our potential for interaction or risk. But instead, a couple million of us, we pile into really close proximity in cities, and then we valiantly ignore each other, right? Isn't that weird? And I know that it can be different. I know I'm capable of connection. I know that a smile takes no more time than ignoring someone. On that rare occasion on the New York subway, when I would hear something funny over the loudspeaker and I'd laugh about it, and then across the way there was a, a woman who heard the same thing and she was laughing, and then we, our eyes would meet and we would smile at each other because we were both laughing at the same thing, that kind of interaction, it makes my day. So I know I'm capable. But most of the time, I'm just rushing around, having my zombie moments, as I call them. You know, I thought it wasn't really harming anyone, was it? Maybe I was even protecting myself. But I started to get an inkling that things were going in a bad direction. I was doing some research, and I discovered, maybe you know this, that in 2003, in those heat waves that swept France, nearly 15,000 people passed away. They died, most of them were elderly. They died because they were living alone, and no one came to check on them. In fact, several hundreds of bodies were left unidentified. And then, in 2011, this happened. The video has no sound.
That baby girl's name was Yu Yu. She was two years old, had wandered out of the store where her dad worked into that street, and after being run over twice, she lay there for almost 10 minutes. 18 people passed her without stopping. And that, I realized, is where we're heading in cities. That is the inevitable outcome of our zombie moments. All of those seemingly harmless little betrayals of each other's humanity, at a certain point they add up and it goes too far. So what is this about? What are my, what are my zombie moments about? What do I say to myself? The things I say to myself, they seem to fall into two groups. In the first group, I say something like, I'm in a hurry. I don't have time to deal with this. I'm exhausted. I don't have enough energy for all of this. I don't have enough attention for the important things in my life, like my family, my friends, my work, let alone a couple million strangers' problems. And I certainly don't have enough money for every stranger who asks me for money. Not enough. Not enough time, not enough attention, not enough energy, not enough money, all those things. They boil down to scarcity, right? And in the second group of responses, the answers go something like this. I don't have to pick up that trash. That's not my trash. I didn't put it there. In fact, that's not my tree. It belongs to the city or something. And that old lady struggling with her bags, she's not my grandmother. She's not really my responsibility. And that young man begging for change, he's not my problem. Mine, mine, mine. Sounds like I'm three years old. So all those answers, they sort of boil down to something I'll call self-interest. Now, scarcity and self-interest, some people call those by other names. They say, that's greed and selfishness, Ariana, and that's human nature. You're not going to change that. Don't even try. I think, okay, fair enough. I'll admit that there are moments when I it's in my human nature to be greedy and selfish. But I also know that depending on the context, I am equally capable of being generous and empathetic. I am. Which means it's about the context, right? So I got to thinking, what context have we created that encourages us to be greedy and selfish? What kind of system have we put into place that rewards scarcity and self-interest? And it seems to me to be pretty clear that the answer is the economic system. Now, if that seems like a lot to take on in the battle to defeat the zombies, the good news is that there are alternatives. There's already something underway called the sharing economy. The sharing economy, you've maybe heard about aspects of it. It includes stuff like car sharing or home sharing, ride sharing. It goes way beyond that, though. Broadly defined, this is only a partial map of a couple of organizations. Broadly defined, it includes stuff like community-supported agriculture and time banks and person-to-person -person lending. And really broadly defined, includes stuff like open data, open education, to education. Uh, open government, where governments share information and they invite citizens in to participate. All, already, all over the world, there are people working on expanding this universe. This is Laura Rainsborough. She lives in Toronto, Canada. That's a city of 2.6 million people. Around 2008, something was brought to Laura's attention. It was an apple tree, heavy, with unpicked fruit. Laura started looking around. She started peeking over fences. And she realized something. She realized that her city is actually a vast orchard. In fact, on the trees of Toronto, 1.5 million pounds of fruit grow. Apples, walnuts, cherries, peaches, apricots, all kinds of stuff. But fruit was going unharvested for a couple reasons. Sometimes the owner was elderly or couldn't do it. Sometimes people weren't sure whether the fruit was safe to eat. Sometimes it was just too much hassle. It was easier to go to the store, buy fruit. But when fruit goes unharvested, it 
becomes a nuisance, right? It falls to the ground, it rots, it attracts rodents. So Laura, and at the same time, people in the city of Toronto were going hungry. So Laura created Not Far From the Tree. Five years later, she has nearly 1,500 volunteers. When a homeowner reports that they have a tree that needs to be harvested, volunteers are sent. A third of the harvest is offered to the homeowner, a third of it is offered to the volunteers for their work, and a third of it is offered, is delivered to food banks and homeless shelters. Laura says that each harvest, something magical happens. That when strangers invite other strangers into their backyard for the task at hand, the fences and the walls that we've built, they cease to exist for a minute. And that the connections formed between people, that social infrastructure that lasts long beyond the fruit when the fruit is enjoyed. The sharing economy is already transforming the way that we live in cities. It's waking up the zombies and turning us into neighbors. This is Ben Berkowitz. He created a project called See Click Fix. It works on your smartphone and online and enables you to report a problem in your city. So something like an abandoned car blocking the road. It allows you to take a picture, GPS automatically uh, tracks the location, an alert is sent so that your neighbors can see it, and a report is automatically sent to the city government, uh, Department of City Government that's in charge of fixing it so that it gets taken care of. Now Ben says that when he created C-Click Fix, he thought of it basically as a streamlined way to complain to government. But it turns out it's being used by people to express their willingness to be part of the solution. In February 2013, there were these big blizzards across the North Atlantic uh, coast of the United States. In the city of New Haven, the official snowplows were totally overwhelmed. People were stranded in their own homes behind mountains of snow, sometimes without heat. So people used C-Click Fix to identify the neighbors most at need, in need, and they organized volunteer brigades of citizens with snow shovels, and they made sure that everyone was safe. All over the world, the sharing economy is already transforming the way that we live in cities. It's waking up the zombies and turning us into neighbors. And this is Mayor Park. He's the mayor of Seoul, South Korea. That's a megacity, 10.5 million people living in Seoul. I had already heard about his commitment to, making sh uh, to make Seoul the next sharing capital of the world. He's giving grants to sharing startups, giving them free office space, technical assistance, and he's really committed to open governance, to citizen participation. In fact, he's so committed that he had a huge statue of an ear erected in front of City Hall. It's eight feet, two some meters. Uh, and it's not just symbolic, this ear. If you speak into the ear, whatever you say gets broadcast inside of the Citizens Affairs Bureau in City Hall. <laughs> but that's not all. I was reading his journal, which is available to read online. Awesome. And he announced an initiative to deal with a problem that exists in a lot of cities, and that is violence against women. Now, too often, people hear something or they see something, and they say, that's none of my business. But the mayor thinks it's everybody, everybody's business. So he's appointed someone in each district of the city to organize patrols of citizens who go out and walk the streets at night, particularly in those areas where there have been incidents, and make sure that everyone is safe. The sharing economy is already working to transform the way we live in cities all over the world. It's waking up the zombies and turning us into neighbors. Now, in the old economy, in the industrial era economy, things were based on the idea of scarcity, right? Value was created from scarcity. But in this new economic model, it has as its fundamental premise the idea of abundance, that we already have enough, we produce enough, it just hasn't been distributed well. It's also based on the fundamental premise of collaboration, that we're better acting together. To me, the great potential in this new economic model is that it rewards the better parts of human nature. Not the greed, 
and the self-centeredness, the selfishness, but the kindness, the empathy, the generosity. To me, the most exciting parts of the sharing economy are not sharing stuff and sharing expertise and sharing skills, although that's all really cool. To me, the most exciting part is sharing responsibility for each other and for these places in which we live. Now, all of this, it might seem kind of new, untested, maybe radical, but in fact, it's very old. It's so old, the values that underlie the sharing economy are really well expressed in an old folk tale that you probably heard as a child. It's called the story of stone soup. In the story, two travelers, weary and hungry from their travels, they come into town. But it's the middle of an economic downturn, and the people of the town, they can't offer them anything. They shut themselves up behind their houses. The travelers say, it's okay. If we could just borrow a big cooking pot, the biggest you have. They take the pot, they fill it with water, they make a fire, they set the pot on the, uh, on the fire, and they drop a stone in the pot. The people of the town, they look out, they come by. What are you doing? And the travelers say, oh, we're making stone soup. It's going to be delicious. All we need is a little something for the taste, a little garnish for on top. So someone from the town says, well, I can spare a little sprig of parsley. And the next person says, I have a potato you can have. And the next person has a carrot, and the next person has a handful of beans, and so on and so forth, until indeed, at the end, there is a delicious soup that the travelers and the townspeople share. To me, the great hope of the sharing economy is that it will awaken our cities full of zombies, turn us into neighbors, and that the streets of those cities will be safe for our elders, women, and children. Thank you. <laughs>